Some fairy tale fans are Disney nuts, but others prefer their fairy tales grim. Very grim, indeed. My name is Liz, the Cosbrarian. Over on TikTok, I've grown a following of folk and fairy tale fans who prefer their tales a little weird, dark, sexy, or funny. Thus, the series Fucked Up Fairy Tales with Liz was born. Some followers have called it Wishbone for Grown Ups. I like to think of it as Jim Henson's Storyteller meets Drunk History. My debut here on YouTube will concentrate on compilations of the tales I've told over at TikTok. Today's compilation focuses on three of my favorite fairy tales collected by the Brothers Grimm. Aller Lyhrau, The Goose Girl, and Rumpelstiltskin. Interested in my sources or in need of content warnings? See the show notes in the description. But most of all, welcome to... Fucked Up Fairy Tales with Liz. Fucked Up Fairy Tales with Liz. Sure, every bride wants a fairy tale wedding. Until that fairy tale is the one where you have to marry your dad. Yes, the subset of fairy tales where fathers try to marry their own daughters is an unfortunate one. It's also my favorite one. A year ago today, for National Tell a Fairy Tale Day, I shared my first fucked up fairy tale and it was all kinds of fur. That's just one of its many names. And so for this fucked up fairy tales anniversary, I'm rebooting it. Fucked up, up fairy, fairy tales reboot. reboot. Ooh. Once upon a time, there was a king who was married to the most beautiful woman in the world. Her hair was pure gold, and her jeans were strong. So their daughter had inherited both her stunning looks and her golden hair. One day, the queen grew ill. And when she sensed death was upon her, she made a stunning request. Promise me <laughs> that you will never marry again, unless it's to one whose beauty matches my own, and who has the same golden hair. Talk about a royal cockblock. At first, the king was too depressed to consider remarrying, so his counselors nudged him in that direction. They sought out all the princesses in the world, but none of them could match the queen's beauty or her signature hair color. And then the king found the loophole. I have an announcement to make. I have finally found a bride who will fulfill the deathbed wishes of my wife. Excellent, your highness. Oh, dad, I'm so happy for you. Good thing, my dear, because the lucky girl is you. Wait, what now? My hot daughter. Oh no. Oh yes. You are the spitting image of your mother, you have her golden hair. And now that I see this, I am desperately in love with you. No one liked this, not one bit. His counselors tried to counsel him out of it, but the princess soon realized she'd have to take matters into her own hands. You know, father, technically I'm already betrothed to another. Yeah, too bad for him. Well, I won't do it without a specific dowry. First I need, um... Uh, a gown that shines as golden as the sun. Literally, not just any silk hack job. That'll keep him busy, right? Here it is, honey. Your golden gown. What? How? Well, I need another gown as silver and luminescent as the moon. Hey, babe, no problem. I got that one, too. Um, one as twinkly and glistening as the stars? Yeah, yeah, I get it. You're an astrology bitch. Here's your third fucking sky dress. Nope, I have another demand. I need a cloak, a cloak of fur. It needs to have a thousand furs, each from a different animal in the kingdom. So our princess isn't exactly a friend to the animals in this one. What can I say? She was desperate. Wow, bloodthirsty. I like it. Commence the hunt. Her father delivered her this thousand fur coat and told her that the wedding would be the following day. That night, the princess gathered together her new fancy dresses as well as several gifts she had received from her fiancé, a young king in a neighboring kingdom. These gifts included a golden ring, a little golden spinning wheel, and a golden reel. She Marie condo her presents and her gowns into a walnut shell. Then she dirtied her skin with soot, donned the thousand fur cloak, and got the hell out of there. She walked all night until she reached a huge forest where she sought shelter in the hollow of a tree. The next morning, the princess was discovered by none other than her bridegroom and his hunting party. Perhaps she intentionally hid out in his kingdom. But it seems like the two haven't met before. I'm assuming it was one of those Tudor-like courtships where they sent each other portraits but never actually met. The king's men saw the bundle of fur and assumed it was a strange animal they'd just discovered. The bridegroom king told them to catch it, and when they pulled her down from the tree, she cried, I'm just a poor child abandoned by her family. I am not a beast to be harmed. The king's men decided to take the girl home and put her to work in the kitchen. And that's when they started calling her all kinds of fur. 
because that's what we do in fairy tales. We name people after the things they are wearing. All kinds of fur assisted the cook, but she also assisted the king with taking his boots off every night. And every night he would throw a boot at her head. This is the romantic lead we're rooting for. The king was holding a ball, and all kinds of fur wanted to see her bridegroom in the flesh. You know, during a time when he wasn't hurling his fucking boots in her face. She asked the cook if she could sneak upstairs to take a peek at the party, and he allowed her 30 minutes. All kinds of fur got quickly cleaned up and into her gown as golden as the sun. When she arrived at the ball, the king was besotted and the crowd went wild. As they danced, the king thought to himself, Say, this dame looks like that lady I'm supposed to marry. But she ran away when they were done and he was unable to verify it. All kinds of fur rushed back to her hovel and got back into her soot and furry cloak. She showed up at the kitchens and the cook told her to make the soup for the night so he could go take a peek at the fancy people. So all kinds of fur whipped up a yummy soup for the king, dropped the ring he'd given her into it, and when the king received his soup, he was most intrigued. This is the best goddamn soup I have ever tasted. Curious. This ring was in the bottom of the bowl. It's one I sent to my fiancé. Summon the cook. I gotta find out more about this soup. When the cook informed the king that all kinds of fur had made the soup, he summoned her as well. So who are you? I'm just a poor orphan, sir. For such a poor orphan, you seem to carry a lot of gold on you. How did you come about this ring? Why would I know anything about a golden ring? I'm so low, people throw their boots in my face. That's a good point. Speaking of which, I'm gonna need you to get these babies off. I've been dancing all night, and my tootsies are real swollen and sweaty. Ugh. Later, when the prince hosted a second party, all kinds of fur repeated her request to the cook to visit it. Once again, she showed up as herself, but this time in her silvery moon gown. The king was now certain she was his betrothed, but once again she slipped away when the dance ended. She returned to the kitchen in her gremlin form, made up the soup, this time dropped the golden spinning wheel into it, and again the king interrogated all kinds of fur with similar results. When the third ball came around, the king was determined not to lose the princess. When she showed up in her gown, glistening like starlight, he told the orchestra to play an extra-long song for their dance. He managed to slip the golden ring onto her finger without her knowing it. When she ran away, she was in a terrible rush because the extra-long dance had cut into her 30-minute time limit. She was in such a rush, she didn't manage to cover her hands very well with the soot. She cooked the king's soup and dropped the golden reel into it. And the king interrogated her after dinner again. When the king interrogated her this time, he saw the flash of her white, very clean, princessy hand. He grasped it before she could run away and pulled the cloak off her. And her magnificent golden hair and beautiful gown was revealed. Surprise, baby! I knew you were my fiancé! Hey, sorry about the whole boots-in-your-face thing. And don't worry about it, I was cosplaying as a lowly poor. For some reason, they rewarded the cook, who barely did anything. And for some reason, our otherwise very resourceful princess married a man who threw shoes at her head. All kinds of fur and donkey skin and other fairy tales of that ilk are often classified under a category called unnatural love. And of course, they each have their quirks. Donkey skin is a French variant, and there's a movie of it. In this, a fairy godmother is really the one that propels a lot of the action and helps the princess along. She-bear is an Italian variant where the girl literally transforms herself into a bear. The king who wanted to marry his daughter is a Scottish variant. And I think it's the one that Sap Sorrow in Jim Henson's Storyteller most mimics. In some versions, it's not the king who wants to marry his own daughter, but rather he betroths her to a monster or some other undesirable match she wants to escape. In some versions, she forgives her father at the end. Philip Pullman thought the Grimm version needed more resolution with the father. So in his take on the Brothers Grimm fairy tale, he has the father pursue her in an even more predatory way. And the tale comes to a climax when she murders him in self-defense. Robin McKinley adapted the tale in her novel Deerskin. She really leans into the abusive relationship between the king and his daughter, and her healing from that trauma. I like the Grimm version the best because, surprisingly, it's the one where the princess has a lot of her own agency. No fairy godmothers, she just gets it done herself. But another reason this category of fairy tales is one of my favorites is because it has fashion in it. Most of the tales feature a part with the princess demanding these gowns that have a magical, ethereal quality to them. In The King Who Wanted to Marry His Daughter, she asks for a dress made of swan's down, a dress made of bog cotton, and a dress of silver and gold that can stand on the ground. In Catskin, she asks for a catskin, 
Uh, rude. And a coat made of feathers of all the birds. In an American variant set in Kentucky, she asks for a dress made of clouds and a dress made of flowers. And I think mossy coats might be the most fun. She asks for a white satin dress with gold sprigs. A dress the color of all the birds in the air. Silver slippers that must fit her exactly. All of the clothes have to. And then her cloak that's a cover-up is a magical one made of moss and gold threads that can transport her wherever she needs to be. I would love to see some fashion drawings of these looks. Tattercoats is an interesting variety in which the girl meets her beloved in her shabby clothes and he falls for her just that way. I'll definitely revisit some of those versions in A Fucked Up Fairy Tale for you. If you enjoy my work and are able to do so, you can support me on one of these platforms. And here's to another year of fucked up fairy tales. One of the first moments of gore in a fairy tale that I remember really repulsing me as a kid was from one of my favorites, The Goose Girl. It's been oft requested, so let's get into it. Once upon a time, there was an old widowed queen who had a beautiful daughter who had gorgeous golden hair. The daughter was betrothed to a prince in the neighboring kingdom. So the queen made her a huge dowry and got her prepared to meet the prince. She assigned the princess a chambermaid for her journey. And she also gave the princess a handkerchief that was stained with three drops of her blood. Now listen, my daughter. These three drops of blood will protect you from harm wherever you go. So don't go losing this handkerchief, all right? I definitely won't. She definitely would. The princess tucked the handkerchief into her bosom for safekeeping, and she set off on her journey with her chambermaid in tow. After they had traveled for a bit, the princess became thirsty, and the chambermaid became mutinous. Chambermaid, I'm thirsty. Would you take the golden goblet my mother gave me and get me a drink of water from this stream? Here's the thing, princess. I'm not really interested in being your maid anymore. So if you want a drink from the stream, lie down and get it yourself, and use your fucking hands. Oh god, I do not know how to deal with this. I- I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get that drink now. The princess leaned over the stream to get a drink, and as she did so, the bloody handkerchief she carried observed this. If your poor mother only knew, her heart would surely break in two. But the princess didn't complain, and they went on on their journey. A little further up, she became thirsty again. Chambermaid, I've become thirsty again. Would you get me a drink with my mother's golden goblet? Um, bitch, we've been through this already? I'm not doing the maid thing? Oh my god, I'm so sorry, I forgot. But this time, when the princess leaned over to get a drink from the stream, the handkerchief she was holding in her bosom fell into the water and drifted away. Oh no! The chambermaid observed that the princess no longer had protection. All right, princess, here's the deal. First off, I'm not riding this cheap, shitty horse that your mother gave me. I want your horse, Falada. Next up, we're going to switch garments. In fact, we're switching places. You will refer to me as the princess, and you yourself will be the chambermaid. And if you tell anybody the truth, I will use my new position of power, and I will have you killed on the spot. Look at me. Look at me. I'm the princess now. Okay. Hmm. It's your word against mine. But truth be told, someone else was observing this whole mutiny. It's me, guys. The horse, Falada. I saw everything. So the false princess and true arrived at the castle. And the prince and princess had never met before, so the prince just assumed the chambermaid disguised was his wife, and he picked her up, carried her off, and he was thrilled. The prince's father, the king, however, observed the particular beauty of the chambermaid. Princess, where did you find this beautiful chambermaid? I don't know, she's some weirdo I picked up out of pity along the road. Just give her some stupid job or something. I don't really have a job for this insanely beautiful chambermaid, but I guess she could assist the little boy that tends to the geese. So the true princess became the goose girl at the castle. Now, the false princess decided she needed to cover her bases. She knew she did have a witness to her mutinous plot, the horse, Falada. So she asked her new husband, Honey, that horse I rode over here is a piece of shit. Would you just, like, behead it or something? And he said, Sure, I'd be glad to. But the true princess heard word that Falada was set to be killed. So she paid the executioner to nail Falada's head to this entryway that she passed through every morning and night uh, to herd the geese. And so now every morning when she passed her poor dead horse, she would say, Oh, my poor Falada. And the dead horse head would reply, Oh, princess, if your mother only knew, her poor heart would break in two. And sooner or later, the little boy, Conrad, who she tended geese with, started to have a lot of questions. So every morning, Conrad and the true princess, a.k.a. the goose girl, would bring the geese out to the fields. And when they would get there, the princess would let her beautiful golden hair out of her cap. And because Conrad is a friggin' teenage boy in the greatest sense of the stereotype, he couldn't resist trying to pull it. 
So the goose girl would pray, O oh, wind, blow with all your might, blow Conrad's cap out of sight, make him chase it everywhere, till I've braided all my hair, so he'll give me some goddamn peace. And the wind would do so for her, and by the time Conrad had captured his hat, the princess had braided and tucked up all of her hair. And he was fucking pissed at her. Girls won't even, like, let you pull their fucking hair out of their fucking head, like, for a fucking joke. This kept happening every morning, and finally Conrad complained to the king. I don't want to work with that girl anymore. Why not? Oh, uh, well, first of all, she's a fucking weirdo. She talks to a dead horse head every morning. Then she can, like, talk to the wind. And she makes it blow my hat away so I can't pull her hair. I'll look into it, but have you considered not being a little shit? So the king spied on the goose girl the next day, and he saw everything occur as Conrad had told him. So that night he pulled her aside and he asked her point blank about what was going on. I can't tell you what happened or I will literally be killed. All right, well, if you don't want to tell me anything, perhaps, um, perhaps you might talk to this old stove. What? But that's crazy. My dear, you talk to a dead horse and the wind. All right, you got me there. It just sounds like you've been through a lot. And what danger could there be talking to an old stove? So the girl took his advice. And then my talking bloody handkerchief floated away. And then she took my talking horse. I'm the princess, stove. I'm the- And meanwhile, the old king eavesdropped on her in the room upstairs, like through the chimney vent. And now that he knew the truth, he immediately got to setting things right. He had the true princess all gussied up and put in beautiful garments. He told his son the truth. Cool, new, prettier bride. So the old king prepared a feast in which they debuted the goose girl, now in her true princess form, but did not tell everyone what her deal was. In fact, they sat the prince with the false chambermaid wife on one side of him and the goose girl on his other side. But the false bride was so bloody with power or distracted, she didn't realize who the goose girl was. Later on in the night, after everyone had been making merry and they were in high spirits, the old king presented the false chambermaid with a riddle. I have a hypothetical situation for you. Imagine a chambermaid forced her princess to trade places with her, and that she then went through with a marriage to a prince, and that she blackmailed that same princess into silence with a threat of death. How would you sentence this chambermaid in this sort of hypothetical situation? And despite the fact that he literally tells her her entire story, she replies, Well, I would have that bitch stripped naked and put into a barrel studded with nails, which I'd have two horses drag through the streets until she was dead. Ugh. Jesus Christ! Is that your final answer? You know, I should have been more specific. White horses drag the barrel. Well, you have pronounced your own sentence. I don't know, Dad. We could do something a little less tortury. Nope, nope. That's what the woman said. We're sticking with it. Oh, no. And after that horrifying sentence had been carried out, the goose girl and the prince lived happily ever after. The end. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a miller who was very poor in money, but very rich in beautiful daughters. Well, he had only one daughter, but she was truly the Michelle Pfeiffer of Miller's daughters. One day, he happened into conversation with the king, and he really wanted to impress this guy. So he told him an outrageous lie. You know, my daughter is not only a real beauty, but she can turn straw into gold. Really? Well, I'm not just going to take you at your word. Bring her to my castle tomorrow. If what you say is true, she and I will get along great. This is your out, Dad. There is no way your daughter can do this. Just don't show up. Your Highness, this is my daughter. Thank you for having us, Your Grace. So you're the girl who can turn straw into gold. I am? Well, let's see it. Turn this whole room of straw into gold. I... 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 I'm sorry. That was a ridiculous command. Whew, I appreciate that. Obviously, you need some time to do it. I'll give you the whole night to do it. Give me a room full of gold by morning, or you die. What? I don't think about running away. I'm locking you in here like a prisoner. Are you serious right now? Dad, will you please explain? Good luck, honey. If I were tasked with turning a room full of straw into gold, I would do exactly what the miller's daughter did. Sit down and start sobbing. But it wasn't long before the door opened and in walked a sassy little man. What's a pretty girl like you doing bawling her eyes out? I am going to be executed tomorrow because I can't turn this straw into gold. So don't bother introducing yourself because I have eight hours to live. Let's see, there's about a dozen bales and 25 kilograms of pop. I'll do it. What? I'll turn the straw into gold. 
You will? Sure. Though, you do need to give me a little something in exchange. Um, my necklace? Sure. Full disclosure, it was $2.99 on the clearance rack at Claire's. I don't mind. It looks real good on me. It does. The little man got to work. He sat down at the spinning wheel and whirr, whirr, whirr. The spool filled up with golden bread. He continued his work until the entire room of straw was transformed into glistening gold. Nicely done. Thanks. Can I go home now? Ha! Don't be ridiculous. Let me show you to your room. Well, that's nice, I guess. And it's full of straw. Well, now that I know what you can do, I gotta take full advantage of it. Okay, you know the deal. Spin the straw into gold by morning, or you die, yada yada yada. Good night. There's no way that little guy will come back, right? Wrong. Oh, thank goodness. Man, this guy's real greedy, isn't he? There's twice as much straw as before. Well, what'll you give me this time? I have a ring. Claire's. Buy one, get one. Hell yeah, I love a good BOGO. Whirr, whirr, whirr. The little man spun through the night. In the morning, the king found the miller's daughter sleeping among twice as much gold. Ooh, I'm gonna have enough gold for a second castle in the Hamptons. All right, let me show you to your new room. Please don't have straw. Please don't have straw. Oh, wow. So much straw. Yep. So straw gold. Morning or you die. But... But? This time, if you succeed again, not only will I never make you spin anything ever again, but I will marry you. I bet you say that to all the girls. Ha! And they say women aren't funny. Who's they? Mostly me. Okay. See you in the morning, either for an engagement brunch or an execution brunch. Good night. Hi. Oh my, you're a fast little guy, aren't you? I don't like to waste time. So, what do you got for me tonight? Um, nothing, really. The shirt off my back. No, no, no. Keep your shirt on. I am not interested in any of that. Then I have nothing. How about a payment plan? Payment plan? I'll spin this straw into gold for you. No down payment interest-free? If you promise me your firstborn child. Wow. Well, if I refuse, I definitely die. Um, do I get to ask what you want with the kid? Uh, no. Okay. I guess I don't really know what will happen. I mean, I might not even have kids. Okay, let's do it. The little man were were word away, and thrice the straw was turned to thrice the gold. So you're really gonna marry that guy, huh? Honestly, I think I have to. I guess if you're gonna marry a gold-hungry, violent piece of shit, it might as well be the most powerful one. Okay, well, I'll see you on the flip side. And by flip side, I mean when you squeeze out that meat baby. I might be having regrets. The king was immensely pleased with the surplus of gold he'd received. And wedding arrangements were made at once. Before long, the new queen gave birth to a little baby. Congratulations! Thank you so much! Oh, no! I can't believe it. I honestly didn't think you'd be back. Well, you know what they say. There's nothing certain except death and taxes and the Fae coming to claim the newborn you promised them under duress. So, let me hold the little tyke. No! Please don't take her. When I made the promise, I didn't realize what I'd be losing. Motherhood changes you. You can't understand that until you have a child. Yeah, 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 I get it. Childless people are worthless. Then just have another one, breeder. I don't need the second or third born. I can give you so much more now than I could as a mere miller's daughter, though. Riches? Property? A title? First off, I can literally make straw into gold. Do you think I'm hurting for spare change? Secondly, riches are bullshit. A living thing is much more valuable to me than any material thing you could offer. Well, that's not comforting. Please, don't take my child. I couldn't bear it if you did. Ugh, oh god. Oh god. Look, there is an escape clause to this whole me taking your baby thing. There is? Why are you even telling me? Please don't tell the other imps, but I'm kind of a softy. I just can't bear to see a lady cry. Ugh, that was embarrassing to admit. Okay, so what is this escape clause? Just guess my name. Guess your name? But there are so many names. <laughs> Ooh, there sure are. But I'll help you out a little bit. It's not John, Jack, Jacob, Jeffrey, Jeremy, Joshua, or any of the other 12 names we keep naming white boys, all right? Michael? Robert? David? What did I just say? Oh, yeah. 
The good news is you have unlimited guesses. That is good. The bad news is you only have three days. That's not great. All right, I'm gonna head out and give you some time to chew on it. Is it Chad? Excuse me? I'm sorry. The queen wrote down every name she could think of that night, and she had messengers travel the country to find names she didn't think of. The next evening, the little man showed up at her chamber. Is your name Casper? Nope. Melchior? Nope. Balthazar? You're really leaning into this wise man thing, aren't you? Cain, Abel, Abraham. I'm gonna give you another hint and encourage you to read something other than the Bible, all right? I'll be back tomorrow. The next day, the queen asked the subjects of her kingdom to send her the most unique names they could think of. She offered those up on the second night to the little man. Albus? Severus? Lucius? Rubius? I'm gonna cut you off there. You will not find it in Harry Potter. Boy, the Bible and Harry Potter really is all you people read, isn't it? I've also read the Da Vinci Code. Oh, is it Apple? Nope, and it ain't goop either. You got one more day. As the final day came around, the queen was truly at her wit's end. But when all hope seemed lost, she got her information from an unexpected source. Boy, have you got to hear about the crazy day I had! Oh? So I'm out and about, hunting for a cute little fox to shoot in the face, because I'm a dick, when I heard this very bizarre, but admittedly very catchy song coming from this little house. Naturally, I peeped inside. And this tiny weirdo was hopping about in one foot and singing his heart out. Say my name, say my name. If no one is around to hear me say it for you, I can win this game. Say my name, say my name. I know I'm kinda shady, cause I want your baby, but it could be changed. Say my name, say my name. If no one is around to hear me say it for you, I can win this game. Say my name, say my name. There's just no way you could win, cause it's Rumpelstiltskin. Better to say my name. The other day, came to call. Make my claim. claim Here to take your babe Unless you guess my name, name. Every time you ask Is it Paul? Yeah. Is it Jay? Jay? Could it be that you Gotta say goodbye to baby? Since I made you swear First of all, let me say Same. I am not the one To sit around and be played Same. So guess what they call me What's the name that I claim Same. But don't just guess the name Since you said to me yesterday And then the pre-chorus was like I know you say that I'm assuming things Stop, stop just stop. What did he say his name was? Okay, let me see. Uh, say my name, say my name, my phone is around too. Let me say it for oh you. Rumpelstiltskin. It was Rumpelstiltskin. Yes! What's the deal with the whole name thing you're obsessed with anyway? Seriously? The little imp arrived for the final night of guessing. And the queen was feeling sassy, so she didn't reveal herself right away. Is it Conrad? Nope. Heinrich? You didn't guess that one already? Maybe. Well, this one's kind of crazy, but is it Rumpelstiltskin? What did you say? You know what I said. The devil told you that. The devil told you that! Rumpelstiltskin angrily stamped his foot so hard it made a hole in the ground and he sank in up to his waist. And he concluded his epic temper tantrum by grabbing his left foot and tearing himself in two. Oh my god. Could somebody clean that up? Yay, 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 yay. Boy, it is an earworm. The end. So during my telling, you may have thought to yourself, huh, I remember a couple details differently. And I don't mean the pop culture references. Well, the Brothers Grimm revised Rumpelstiltskin a lot from their 1812 version to the 1857 version, which is probably the one you know. I picked my favorite parts of each, including that the king is the one who discovers Rumpelstiltskin. I just think he fucking owes the queen, you know? Now some of you have asked me to share other versions of this tale, and there are a lot of them, all under the category called Name of the Helper. But I find that generally the tales are so similar or frankly kind of boring that you don't want to see me act them all out. But I will eventually make a video where I show you my favorite snippets of the variants. That's all for tonight, but remember kids, Keep an eye out for weirdos singing their name in the woods. You never know whose life you could be saving. I'll see you for the next Fucked Up Fairy Tale. Thank you for watching Fucked Up Fairy Tales with Liz. If you enjoyed yourself, please like, comment, and subscribe. If I reach 5,000 subscribers here on YouTube, I'll start making original content here just for you. Want to listen to my tales in podcast form? Then you should check out my Patreon. There, supporters can upvote tales I tell. 
check out behind-the-scenes content, and listen to Fucked Up Fairy Tales, the podcast. My next compilation of tales will air here on September 20th, where I will share a couple of my favorite Hans Christian Andersen tales. See you then for the next Fucked Up Fairy Tale. Fucked Up Fairy Tales with Liz. Fucked Up Fairy Tales with Liz.